Well, welcome to the Tuesday night edition of our uh, uh, study in the Word of God and our seeking to be revived and awakened in so many ways here at the Bethel Baptist Fellowship Church. And to um, have this opportunity to open up the Word of God with you is a great, great privilege. My name is Morris Gleiser, and uh, I, I count some of you as friends that we met a, about three years ago, others of us have never met before. I'm grateful uh, that Pastor Bickle is allowing us to have these nights together. Now, let me ask you to do the same thing that uh, we have done the two previous uh, services, both Sunday morning and the Monday night service, and that's this. Please have your Bible in hand. Have it ready. If you're a note taker, you might want to just grab uh, uh, your your notepad and, and uh, pen and paper and take the time to write some things down. That would be greatly uh, very, very helpful if you would. It'd be helpful for you and help you to stay engaged. And then then would you just ask the Lord to, to speak to you? And I mean that. I mean, plan to be responsive to the truth of God's Word. Anytime you go to the Word of God, it's not a time of just information. It's a time for us to be going through transformation into more Christ-likeness. And I'm going to tell you, tonight's message is a subject that uh, is at the top of my list as far as passages go in the Word of God that continue to minister to my own heart. And I want it to be the same for you. And when we're finished here in a few more moments, which you say, well, what does that mean? I'm not sure. Hopefully within the window that I've promised to stay within. I, I, I'm going to tell you, when we're finished, I'm going to feel as if I left a lot on the table and a lot on the paper of the scriptures that I didn't get to cover with you, but I wished that I could. Let the Lord speak to your heart. It is a great truth. My favorite gospel writer is Mark. Would you go to the gospel of Mark with us tonight and get chapter 5 open and be ready to listen. This is going to be a help for everyone, young people. I mean, even to the youngest of ages, certainly teenagers, young adults, moms and dads and singles and our dear senior saint friends, would you, would you just follow along? Let's take a journey with the Lord Jesus tonight. Here in Mark chapter 5, we have an account of what I call hope for hopeless people. Now, you may not consider yourself to be hopeless, and sometimes as a result of that, it, it affects it affects your, your prayer life. It affects your dependency upon your Lord. Look, the Lord, let's get the backdrop. Let's get the setting, and then I want to read to you. I'm giving you time to find Mark 5. Hopefully, you have found it by now. Jesus has traveled from the western side of the Sea of Galilee by boat with his disciples over to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And it's over, in, in the process of traveling there, uh, a heavy storm comes in, a terrible storm, a frightening storm comes in. Uh, this is not my message for tonight, but it, isn't it wonderful to think about how the Lord Jesus, after he was awakened, he calmed the wind and he told the waves to be calm and be still. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen the Lord Jesus do that. I'm telling you, that would have been phenomenal. And then Jesus and his disciples went over to that uh, eastern side. And it's over there where uh, a maniac, a man that is consumed and controlled by what he himself called a legion of demons came out before the Lord Jesus. He was a man out of control. Jesus called for those demons to come out of him. They and told them to go inside the uh, the uh, re, those swine that were nearby, about two thousand of them, and the swine, those hogs, began to jump over a cliff into the depths of the water and the rocks below. Well, the people of Gadara, even though they saw the change in this maniac man, a man who had frightened them so many times, they. Uh, they wanted Jesus away from their shore. They wanted Jesus away from their community. I, that's odd to me, but they didn't like 
the fact that he had affected their environment. You meet people like that today. They have no time, no interest in the Lord. So Jesus gets back inside the boat and he and his disciples make their way back over to the western side. And over there on the western, northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is someone extremely important. I've often called him the star of the Galilee area. I mean, everybody was talking about him. Everybody wanted to be around him. They loved him because of what he had done for them in days gone by. And gone by. Jesus makes it to the shore. We're going to read what happens. Jesus gets to the shore. You're going to see that the crowds so thronged him, he couldn't even get away from the shore. Can you imagine? Picture this. Jesus standing uh, on the probably muddy, rocky shore, uh, and uh, the crowds of people were just gathering around him, thronging him, applauding him, longing for his words and his help. When all of a sudden through the crowd comes a man that we are given his name, Jairus. And Jairus was the synagogue leader of Capernaum. He was well known. Uh, he was wealthy. He really was. He was well educated. Not everybody, certainly in Galilee, uh, were well educated, but Jairus was. And Jairus came up before the Lord Jesus, and he was a man that was so well respected, he does something that is drastic. It is uh, remarkable. He falls down on his knees, on his face before the Lord, and he makes a plea. Let's read it, all right? Mark chapter 5, look at verse 21. It says, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, now here's why he fell on his face before the Lord. My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him. Don't let that, that phrase pass you by. Jesus didn't put him off. Jesus didn't get into an argument with him. Jesus didn't say, well, Jairus, um, aren't some of your friends, uh, some of the other Pharisees and religious leaders who really don't have much time and uh, desire or belief in me? No, it says there, and Jesus went with him. He went with him. Why? Well, he was going, and it says, and much people followed him and thronged him. This is phenomenal. So Jesus is making his way toward the house of Jairus, and then something happens. On the way, a woman who has been diseased for 12 years comes up, and she, she is so diseased, she has such a blood infirmity that she's not even allowed to go in the synagogue where Jairus that had been in our story here, uh, she couldn't even go in the synagogue. She was considered unclean. And uh, she's a diseased woman. Not only is she diseased, she is uh, she's devoid of all of her funds. She is literally wiped out. She has spent all of her money on all the medical doctors and witchcraft people of that generation. For 12 years, she has sought medical help. Nothing's helped. Nothing has helped. But she hears that Jesus is coming to town. And she gets somehow or another into the crowd. And no doubt people were trying to push her away, not, not touching her, but telling her to get away. And she reaches up and touches the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus, probably a tassel off of his uh, robe. And immediately Jesus turns and he says, who touched my garment? And the disciples say, give us a break. Are you kidding me? Everybody's touching your garment. Everybody's running into you. We're in a mob of people. And Jesus keeps asking, who touched my garment? Who touched me? And finally, the woman comes out and she's, she's, she's fearful internally and externally. And she falls before him and she tells him why she did. And Jesus says to her, I just adopted you. 
you're in my family. Let's read it. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered, min suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his garment, his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press or in the crowd, and he said, who touched my clothes? And he kept repeating it, by the way. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Did you see that? He called her daughter. Now, hang on. Jesus looked at this frightened, uh, formerly extremely ill, sick person who knows within herself that she's been healed because she has touched the Son of God. And he says, I just adopted you into the family. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. She was not only healed physically, she was healed spiritually. Let me pause and say something very emphatically. There may be someone listening to me right now trying to go through this passage, and you, you've heard about Jesus, but you've never been, let me use the Bible explanation here, healed spiritually. You see, all of us were born into this world spiritually sick separated from God, but you'll never get healthy. You'll never become whole in God until you admit, I'm sick and I need a savior. And the only one who can rescue your sin, sick soul is the savior, Jesus Christ. Come to him tonight. Ask him to come into your life, forgive you of your sin. He wants to save you. And so Jesus talks to this woman and she expresses her faith and Jesus says, you're a part of the family. Have you forgotten about the other part of the story? There's a man named Jairus whose daughter is dying. He's a desperate daddy. And he's saying, can we go? Can we go to the house? And so they turn to go to Jairus' home. And somebody from Jairus' home, maybe a servant, maybe a family member, comes to him and says, don't bother the, ta the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. Would you notice what happens when those words are expressed? Look with me, if you would, please, at verse 35. And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. All right, put on your seatbelt and hang on. Let me go through some things here with you. Jesus goes to Jairus' home. At the house, there were already a bunch of professional weepers and mourners making all kinds of racket and noise because this girl is dead. And Jesus says, she's not dead. She's only asleep. It shows how uh, both professional they were and unprofessional they were in the fact that they started laughing Jesus to scorn and said, you don't know what you're talking about. She is dead. And Jesus said, you be gone. And so they leave. And Jesus walks into the room, into that room where the little girl's at, takes her by the hand. Can you picture this? Picture it. He takes her by the hand and he says, little girl, little dove, little daughter, I say to you, rise up. <laughs> and I'm telling you, she rises up. She's brought to life. 
and she runs around the house. Why? She's a 12-year-old girl, man. She starts running around. Immediately, she has strength in her legs. And Jesus says, let's don't go outside and tell anybody about this. Let's just enjoy this moment. You need to give her some food. She needs some food. All right, let's look at some things. Can I just lay real quickly a couple of things on your heart? From this story, I see, number one, I see the fact that there is the wideness of God's mercy. In this whole account, there's a wideness of God's mercy. And when you recognize the wideness of his mercy, what he's trying, one of the things he's trying to teach us is this, come to me believing. Let me say it like this. When you see the wideness of God's mercy, you can come believing. What is your prayer life like? Is there any sense of expectancy when you pray? I mean, when you, when you go to God in prayer, do you go to God in prayer? Do you have a regular time in prayer? Let me ask you this. Do you ever irritate the devil because of your prayer life? Do you live your days living with a sense of expectancy? Maybe today God's going to answer my prayer. In this story, in this account, we see Jesus caring for two different parties. On one hand, you've got this well-known, wealthy, uh, well-educated man, Jairus. Everybody knew him. And then you've got an unnamed, unknown, diseased woman that everybody avoided. You talk about a social spectrum of complete diversity. They're on both sides of the spectrum, and both of them were desperate and in need of the Lord. To whom, let me ask you, to whom did Jesus give the most care and attention? And just think about it. To, to which one did Jesus show the most concern? <laughs> the answer is, he showed compassion and concern for them both equally. So what does that mean? It means, friends, you and I don't come to the Lord with some spirit of, I deserve this, God. I mean, look, I've been a Christian for a long time. Look, I, I, I've I, been get going to church. Look, I've been listening to services online faithfully. I'm, I've been giving my money and my, and my offerings to, the, to my local church. Look, look, I'm, I'm trying to be a very faithful believer. Surely you're going to hear my request. Let me tell you something. Both of these people were desperate. And what you see in this whole story is that you don't come to the Lord patting yourself on the back, thinking that you expect or that you deserve anything. You come desperate. You come to him desperate, broken, and say, I need you. Look, friends, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a firm believer that many of the times in our lives, we hit the proverbial wall of desperation. And it's at times like that that we truly learn what it is to depend upon and call out to our God. I was in a need like that at college one time. I was in great need financially. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I'm telling you, I was in dire need financially. And I asked the Lord to help me that one particular day and all day long, I was calling on him, and I, I, I was asking him, Lord, provide the funds today. I need them today. I, I went to my mailbox a couple, a couple of times expecting him to give me some help financially. Didn't come. Uh, I, I, I thought maybe somebody would come up and just hand me a check or a wad of bills of some sort. It didn't come. I had a job while I was in college working at a grocery store, I thought maybe they'd give me a raise in pay or a, a bonus check of some sort. It didn't come. I, I waited all day long. And I'm going to tell you, I prayed all day long. God, please. Oh, God, please. I'm expecting you to help today. Can I just tell you? I was discouraged by the end of my night at work. I got in my car driving back to college. And as I was driving back, I reminded the Lord that I asked him to help me before that day was out. Now, this just this doesn't always happen. But I said, Lord, I'm about to go back to my college campus, go to my dorm room, and go to bed. The time is, is short. Would you please help me now? I got back to my dorm. As I was walking toward my room, my roommate was coming to me. 
And he said, would you come here? We walked down the hall and and he said, this has been on the door of our room all night long. And he says, it's driving me crazy to see what's in it. Uh, I, it was a, he was a unique guy. And so I looked up, there was an envelope taped on my our dormitory room door, had my name written on it. I pulled it off the door and opened it up. And there was, without any letter, without any note, telling me who it came from, there, man, I don't know how many times I've told this. I love this. There was a handful of bills inside that envelope. I don't know what person the Lord used, but I do know this. The Lord used that person to be a help to me, to remind me that I, I don't come deserving of anything. I can come believing. These two people, Jairus and the unnamed woman, they both recognized the nature of Jesus. What is his nature? Well, he, he was caring, compassionate. He was capable. He was the only one who could help. Nobody else could raise a daughter back to life. No doctor, nobody else could bring healing to a diseased body. So what do we have here? We have two desperate people who recognize the nature of the Lord Jesus. And so they, well, you know, when you recognize the nature of the Lord, and what is that? He's caring, he's compassionate, and he's capable. When you recognize his nature, you can request with nerve. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said. Come boldly to the throne of grace to ask help and mercy for time, in time of need. When do you go to the Lord? In time of need, desperation. How do you come? Boldly. Who is it that's supposed to come? Followers, believers of the Lord Jesus. And may I ask you, do you have a prayer life that's urgent like this? Do you have a prayer life that recognizes the nature of your Lord, that you can come believing? You see, the wideness of his mercy, you don't come patting yourself on your spiritual back saying, I deserve God to hear my prayer. You come needy. You come broken. You come empty. You come desperate. And you say, I need your help. And so you come believing. But there's one more thing. I love this. What happened after Jesus healed the diseased woman and her uh, disease of 12 years of internal bleeding of some sort has now been cleansed. Jesus then turns and Jairus, I, I'm reading between the lines here, but I can imagine old Jairus is pulling on the arm of the Lord saying, we got to get to my home. We got to get there. My daughter's dying. My, my, my dear wife is leaning over the baby a girl, the 12 year old girl. You've got to come. I need you to come. And Jesus turns and starts walking with Jairus again. And as they go, a messenger comes and says, it's too late. She's already dead. Don't waste the master teacher's time. It's too late. And what does Jesus say? Look back at our text. Look at verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. So what have we learned? We've learned that there's a wideness of God's mercy so you can come to him believing. And now we also see the wonder of his might. And when you recognize the wonder of his might, his mighty power, I mean, come on, he raises a girl back to life. She's been, she's dead. Here's a, here's a woman that's been diseased that people have avoided for 12 years. Look, she could have been even divorced. Why? Because no one wants to be near this diseased woman. And Jesus gives her back her health as well as spiritual life. You see the wonder of God's might. So what does Jesus say to Jairus? He says, you came to me believing now. Only believe. You know what he's saying? Keep believing. Keep believing, Jairus. I know it's gotten worse. I know it doesn't look hopeful. I know that it looks as if nothing's going to return to your favor. But keep believing. 
You see the wonder of his mighty power. So no matter what it is that is a burden and a trial and a hardship and a struggle in your life, it may even be a time of real discouragement and disappointment in your life. It may be to the point to where you feel as if nothing's ever going to change. But can I remind you, there is no issue that Jesus cannot solve. There is no burden that he cannot carry. There is no relationship that cannot be healed. There is no person that's too far away from God that cannot be saved. There is no sickness he cannot heal. I don't know what it is, friend, that you may be carrying tonight. But I'm telling you, this truth so grips my heart every time I think on it. And I've had to remind myself of it multiple times. He is a mighty God. He is a wonderfully, incredibly powerful Savior. So keep believing. Don't get distraught. Don't get discouraged. Bottom line is this. When you pray with this kind of faith, what you're doing is this. You are calling. You are focusing. You're asking for the unlimited power of God. Stop right there. The unlimited power of God. You're calling on His power to focus on a situation or on one particular person. You're asking God to touch that situation. So therefore, keep believing. There's no room for worry. There's no room for fear and fret and, oh God, where are you? No, no. There's no room for this up and down moodiness that we seem to live in in our Christianity. And tell you what, there's no room for any mediocre Christianity. This ought to fire you up. It does me. It ought to cause you to recognize this is my God, and I've entered into his presence talking to him. Many of you know the name George Mueller. George Mueller was a man who founded five orphanages in the London or Bristol, England, back in the 1800s. It's a remarkable story, the stories of George Mueller. Did you know that he traveled uh, hundreds of thousands of miles in ministry travel. This was before planes. This was before automobiles. And yet he traveled by boat or by other animal of some sort. And he got around in such a way uh, that uh, he could get to he could get to places to minister. And he 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 lived a long life. But many things are told to us about his his accounting of faith and believing in God to answer uh, his prayers with reference to his orphanages. The most famous story, I think, that many of you maybe even know is the day in which George Mueller oh, awakened and when he, he came downstairs to the dining room, the table was set, all the plates, bowls, cups, glasses, silverware was in place, but there was no food on the table. There was no food in the house. And the children, the orphans, were gathered around the table. He had been told, Mueller had, that there was no food. George Mueller lifted his head and lifted his hand to the Lord, and he simply said, God, I thank you that you're going to provide for us what we need today, and we thank you for this morning's breakfast. At that moment, a knock came to the door. Can you believe this? You say, I can, Morris. Yeah, it's the truth. This is the mighty God that we serve. A knock came to the door. They went over and opened the door. And there standing at the door was a local baker. And he said, Mr. Mueller, I don't know why, but he said, God would not allow me to sleep during the night. He said, I've been up since two o'clock in the morning baking bread and baked goods for you and the children. Do you need these baked goods? He said, we do. They brought in all the bread and the food for the morning breakfast and even probably beyond. And another knock came to the door. They went over and opened the door and there stood a milkman. Back in the day when milkmen would travel uh, by a, a horse-drawn cart 
and would take milk to people's homes and businesses. And there stood at the door a milkman. He said, Mister, he said, my cart just broke down out here on the road. And he said, it broke an axle and I got to repair the axle. And he said, my cart it needs to be repaired. He goes, it's filled with the crates or, or, or cans of milk. And he says, they're all going to spoil and go bad. He said, can I just give these cans, canisters of milk to the orphanage? He said, yes, you can. They brought in all that milk and they had a delightful meal. I've often thought about those children. Their eyes would have been bugged out. Wow, that's our God. Yes. It is. It's the same Lord that you've read about multiplied times in scriptures. And probably you've even experienced in your own life times in which God did things that couldn't be explained by human words. You see the wideness of his mercy. So come to him believing, believing that he hears and that he answers prayer. You see the wonder of his might. So keep believing. Come to him with the burdens of your heart. And I don't know what it is you may be carrying on your heart tonight, but I hope that you'll never forget the story of Jesus in Mark chapter 5, going to Jairus' home, raising a girl back to life, and in the process, seeing an unnamed diseased woman brought into the family of God and healed. God hears our pleas. He wants us to come with our desperate cry to him. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for our friends here at Bethel Baptist Fellowship, for Pastor Bickle and his pastoral care and leadership through the years. But now tonight, Lord, we've looked at the passage here in which you, Lord Jesus, meant the needs of your people in a specific way, both then and and tonight, because, Lord, we learn from the teaching of what took place on that wonderful day in Galilee. And I pray that you'll encourage the hearts of your people tonight. Help them to recognize that you still answer prayer. Not only that you answer prayer, you do the miraculous. And God, I pray that you'll comfort the one who is needing to be comforted tonight, the one who's fearful. Would you relieve the fear? Would you strengthen the prayer life? of your people. Lord, revive us in desperate pleading in our prayer life to a mighty God. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do in individual lives and in the life of the church family. We ask it all in your beautiful and wonderful name. Amen. God bless you, friend. Thank you for listening.